Greetings, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Pot Scum. I am your host, the number one scumbag, a.k.a. Diamond David Lee Roth Jr., but you all know me as Rex Ruger, Triple X Rex, the hardest working man in show business. That's right. I am the son of glam, the front man for the band, always going out with a bang, got a million fans, always smoking a few grams, shazam, a wop bop a loop bop a wop bang bam, coming here in your face with another episode of Pot Scum. And the David Lee Roth Jr. thing, by the way, heavily, heavily in the works. Yep, the process is rolling right along. And uh, should be hearing back good news here anytime. But more importantly, we should be getting good news here any second because we got ourselves a good guest. That's right. As usual, we got ourselves another face puncher. Not of the musical sort, of course. This guy literally does it. With the Dukes. So, I'm going to come in here and see what he's got to say when he joins us here. And hopefully, here he is. Live and in the flesh. You guys are going to like this one. There he is. We got a Donnie Lalonde sighting. Wow. How are you, sir? Well, technology is not my forte. As you no, know. you know what? It's really not mine either. I sometimes I think, what the hell am I doing in this whole podcasting thing? You know, I mean, I'm ah. I'm, 40, I'm I'm 49 years old, so that was not my generation. But uh, I wanted you to see. Uh, I wanted you to see that you're not the only one that could grow a, a beautiful set of locks. Oh boy, you got some hair. Yeah. Good for well, you. well, I happen to be the offspring of of uh, David Lee Roth, so I don't know if you're familiar with who that is, but of course. Yeah, I'm 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 the illegitimate son. Could there be any doubt? Uh, <laughs> you got a Pamela Anderson around? <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I wish there were. Well, wait a minute. Let me make sure the wife isn't listening. <laughs> um, so, so it's really an honor to be joined by you. And I was just looking over uh, your credentials. Uh, Forty-one and five as a career record. Are you an International Boxing Hall of Famer? Do you think you are? Uh, I, no, no, I, I don't think so. I think guys like. James Tony, who was just inducted, Roy right. Jones Jr., who was inducted, multiple time champions, multiple weight champions, guys who did, you know, a lot of guys become world champion these days. Uh, not so much in the 80s, but certainly these days. And uh, had I beat Leonard, probably, you know. But what constitutes it, though? Because I was looking at guys who got in, and I don't know if it's just because uh, it was a posthumous uh, kind of honor, but a guy like Arturo Gatti. Uh, finishes his career at 40 wins and nine losses. Um, but he gets in though. Is it because yeah. of the wars that he, is it because of the wars that he had with Mickey Ward? I think a lot of it's politics also, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you're, I was, an, out, I was an outsider in the game. Like I, I was not connected to any promoter. The Leonard fight I promoted myself and Ray formed a company to promote. Okay. When I won the world title and defended it, it was promoted by, uh, business guy in uh in trinidad you know what i mean i was never really lined up like uh, don king came and sat beside me at the garden one day my yeah. manager was right beside me he sat on the other side and there was a moment of quiet and he leaned over he goes when are you gonna leave this bum and be with a real boxing guy and i said never and he, i looked him right in the eyes i said never he got up and walked away you know uh and then you know there's uh Media did some really nasty stuff to me that was completely uncalled for. Yeah, I met them years later and called them out on it. And they were like, well, yeah. Donnie, your manager was an asshole to us when uh, he managed Ray Mancini. And that was our way to get back at him. We're sorry you had to take the licks personally. Right. You know, so I really think a lot of it's politics and I didn't play the game. Right, right. So um, you've been in there with uh, some big names, among them Bobby Chez, Virgil Hill, Sugar Ray Leonard, who you uh, had just mentioned. When you fought Sugar Ray Leonard, um, did you really uh, have a firm belief uh, in the fact that you were getting the best Sugar Ray Leonard? Because he'd been in and out of the game a couple of times. Did you feel like, uh, uh, you know, have, having him left and come back a couple of times, did, uh, did you feel that night when you were in the ring that you were getting the best Sugar Ray Leonard? Well, I mean, certainly it was not the Leonard of 1980 that fought Durant. Sure, sure. You know, 
no, and, and any you have to be a fool not to see that. Right. But I can tell you, he was a hell of a fighter when I fought yeah. him. Yeah, and you did drop still, him. You, you did drop him once. He still he still had the resilience and the yep. guile to survive because you know he he's quoted as saying that fight he got the most punishment of any fight he was ever had. Really? So yep. I hit him harder than anybody ever hit him. Yeah. All kinds of things. You know, uh, it was a good fight, and he won because he was that talented and resilient. He took a beating in that fight. Like he never yeah. took punches like that, but. On the other hand, I was also quite weakened by overtraining. And okay. so uh, that's, you know, that's on me. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying I made mistakes that led to my demise. I also made mistakes in the fight that right. created the opportunities for him. Right. So, uh, hey, he was a great fighter. He was a great fighter. I don't take anything away from Sugar Ray Leonard. Now, ex now explain to my audience because, uh, uh, I, you know, boxing is is probably my favorite sport. I understand a lot of the inner workings of it. But explain what you mean when you say overtraining. Because a lot of people probably think for a fight or for any kind of, uh, you know, physical competition that there could be no such thing. What does overtraining mean in boxing? When you wear yourself down to a point that by fight night you don't have enough to even get through the fight. Okay. Like in other words, you know, you need to save some for the, like they say, don't leave it on the road. Don't do too much road work. Don't run too right. much. Don't run too fast. Don't run too often. You know, I ran right. too much, too fast, too often. Right. Don't right. spar too much because you leave it in the gym is the saying. Right. And right. I spar 10 rounds a day for eight weeks, five days a week. Too much sparring. You know? Right. Okay. So That's I fair enough. It. And I didn't overdo it because it was Sugar Ray Leonard I was fighting. I overdid it because... I had a, a nature to do that. It was my, na my nature to do that. Right. My trainers, honestly, my trainer, I mean, he's a very good man. It was because of him the fight happened, actually. My manager, he helped my manager a lot. And I'm not taking anything away from Tommy Gallagher, but I'm going to say this. I was overtrained. He okay. should have held me back. He should have seen me overdoing it, and he didn't. And the reason is because we had a weight stipulation with Ray. And we had a verbal agreement that any pound I came in at the weigh-in over the weight limit, forget about that I could lose it, but if I weighed right. over the weight limit at the weigh-in, it was a million dollars every pound I was over off my okay. purse. Okay, okay. My trainer was not going to lose $100,000 every pound I was over, so he made sure I was under, and I right. was like five pounds under. And I had already had to lose 30 pounds to make that. Right. Right. So I, I was overtrained. I'm and, and I, you know, I'm a fighter. I trained for you know many years before that fight. So right. I knew I was overdoing it, and I should have stopped myself. So I will take full responsibility. But the fact is, by the fourth round, fifth fifth round, when it started, I was seeing triple. I was lightheaded. I was dizzy. You know, okay. I was overtrained. I didn't have enough in me to fight t twelve rounds. Okay. Okay. Um. You're originally from Canada? Yes, Kitchener, Ontario. I was born, but really grew up in Vancouver. And then at 14, when I started fighting, I was in Winnipeg. And was boxing, uh, from a young age, was boxing always the dream? Did you not get pulled into the, uh, uh, into the hockey? Kind of hard not to up in Canada, right? <laughs> well, hockey was the dream, actually. I got pulled oh, okay. into boxing because I was try I would try to get to school, to my Catholic school, and I would have to past the protestants we lived in a housing project and i had to pass the protestants so i would have to fight my way to school and so my mom said if you have to fight your way to school you're going to be late every day so you need to learn how to fight faster fights so you got to go to the boxing gym so i went to the <laughs> boxing gym so i was actually pulled into boxing and then hockey was my passion and i was pretty good at it but like i was on all-star teams i was the leading scorer in the league but i didn't have the fundamentals i wasn't a great skater and I would go to all-star games and 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 uh, uh, higher league tryouts, and I was the worst skater on the ice, but I was the best goal scorer in the league. You know, so I, anyway, uh, I didn't have the fundamentals. So I uh, and then boxing, kind of like I was watching TV one day and I saw Marvin Johnson versus Matthew Saad Muhammad, and if you ever saw that fight, it was 1977. Mm -hmm. It was an unbelievable war, and uh, I think in the eighth round. I said, because it was just toe-to-toe -to -toe war, I said, this guy, Matthew Saad Muhammad, has to come out this round and not stop punching until this guy goes down 
Otherwise, he's going to get knocked out. And that's exactly what he did. And it was the most warrior uh, visual I had ever experienced. And I thought, what a great way to live. I would love to be a boxer. And that's yeah. when I started. I just, yeah. you know, I love the dream of just giving all you've got and trying to overcome and anything and everything, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, So uh, your nickname, the Golden Boy, you, 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 you laid claim to that before Oscar did. Well, Correct? yes, that is true. It was like 1982 and he came up with that probably 85 or something. I don't know. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was kind of given to me by a promoter. Uh, the idea was, you know, to try and uh, present an image in boxing that was unique to the norm. Right. You know, back then right. it was boxing was an underground sport, bad people in it, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And we're like, yeah. what are you talking about? Like, I mean, it's not a, like my experience. I mean, I, I, I was threatened by the mafia. I, I went through some crazy stuff in boxing. Really? But I also had s some wonderful people in my life. It changed my life. It gave me more in my life than anything else ever had. So, I mean, I think there's good people and bad people in every industry. And boxing sure. is no different. Boxing sure. is no different. So, so the idea was to be the golden boy, just to show that good people are also in the sport. Well, going back to the hockey thing, though, you did have the mullet for it, though. Yeah, yeah. I definitely had the mullet for hockey. You definitely, yeah, you definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, so uh, – What's your opinion right now of, uh, uh, since I have you on here, what's your opinion now? Are these good or bad for boxing, these gimmick fights that you see, like these Jake Paul type fights? Do you like these or are, are they making a mockery of the sport? Well, first of all, I mean, boxing is entertainment, you know, sports right. are entertainment. Uh, people like watching them. So who cares? You know, I mean, real fighters. I mean, the one thing I can say, and, I, and this is no disrespect to Rockman, or anybody who fights Jake Paul, but a guy who's worth hundreds of millions of dollars fighting a guy who's not worth almost any money, like, I mean, in real right. net worth. I mean, what's the chance of them being able to fix that fight? Right, right. And that's the only thing that bothers me. And again, I'm not speaking specific to this fight. I'm saying in general, when you've got Roy Jones fighting a guy who's never fought before and calling it his 50th win. Right, right, right. You know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. But using boxing platform as an entertainment space and people loving watching it i don't see anything wrong with it. i don't care you know but but then there's a right. the real sport too that's different well i know that's the rub with some of the guys who toil away at it uh and dedicate their lives to it as a lifestyle i i think sometimes it, it it's a it's a whole thing of you know these guys coming along and getting these huge purses and kind of like leapfrogging these guys that have been in the game for a long time kind of you know slaving away at it yeah, but, you know, that's business. That, that really has nothing to do with it. I mean, the reason right. why you don't get all that money is because nobody's watching you fight. Right, The reason right, they get right. all that money is because they have a big fan base for whatever reason, you know. Right, right. I, I don't really buy that. Like, I got really, really lucky in that I had a great manager. Yeah. Great timing. Michael Spink moved up from light heavyweight to heavyweight. Great luck in that Sugar Ray moved up from middleweight to light heavyweight to fight me because he wanted to beat Tommy Hearns and have five – titles instead of Tommy had four, yep, you know, weight yep. division. I got very lucky. And so what, am I a bad guy because I was lucky? You know what I mean? Right, right, right. sure, no, sure. No, no other light heavyweight in the history of boxing made a quarter of what I made to defend their title against Ray Leonard. Right, right. One made, one made 25%. That was Michael Spinks, probably the right. greatest light heavyweight ever. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, people could say something negative about me, but I just got lucky, and I'll admit it. You know what I mean? Yeah. What am I? And what do you want me to do? Give the money away? Nothing, hey, no. nothing. Lo there's nothing wrong with a life with a little bit of luck sprinkled into it. I'll tell you. You right. know, I mean. And you make um, your luck. You know. Now, at one point, did you have uh, 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 interactions, or at some point in your camp, uh, 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 work with Teddy Atlas? And was there a falling out there with Teddy Atlas? Well, you know, I didn't. Uh... I never really connected with Teddy Atlas. Teddy Atlas is the kind of guy that uh, is like a browbeater, like a military guy. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, not my that thing. Me. I'm a free spirit. You can't treat me like that. You know, you can't talk to me like that. Teddy was 28 years old. I was 25. Don't talk to me right. like you're some drill sergeant. Right, you know, right. My, you're my boxing trainer. And you don't need to motivate me by yelling at me and, and talking disrespectfully to me because I'm a, you know, common sense individual tell me what you want me to do and i'll do it you know right 
So he was just a different personality type that was not, that didn't work for me. Like maybe a guy like Michael Moore needed that. Maybe right. a guy like somebody else needed that. But I mean, I spoke to a number of the other guys, Shannon Briggs, a number of the other guys after Teddy and I, uh, that book came out and he told all his bullshit story about me, uh, yeah. him and me, which is 99% lies. All of it is just ridiculous. Fair um, enough. And, um, and they all said, you know, we went through the same stuff with Teddy. He's a nutcase, blah, blah, blah. And that really <laughs> helped me because I thought, is it me? Am I nuts? Like, I mean, this guy literally right, was right. nuts, you know? Yeah. And so whatever. I mean, hey, hats off to him. He had a Hall of Fame career. He did, yeah. he did do some great stuff with great fighters. And uh, did he make them or did they make him? Who knows? But True. the bottom line is, I, I, you know, I went up to him at the Foreman Moore fight in Vegas. He was standing around. There was people around. And I saw him. And I just thought, because, you know, it had been about five years since we had seen each other and I had yeah. left uh, him. I trained with him for 10 months and it was not a good 10 months. Right. I was very injured all the time. Anyway, whatever. And so um, so I went up to say, hey, congratulations. I was just so happy for him. You know, he was a young kid when he started, when I was with him. He hadn't yeah, yeah. trained anybody. I mean, yeah, he was in Mike Tyson's camp, but he wasn't, he didn't make Mike Tyson. Customato did, you know. Right. And, and so uh, I just went up to him to say, congratulations. I was just happy for him. And he just started swearing his head off, just yelling and screaming at me in front of all these people. And I went to go up and give him a hug and say, congratulations. You know, he's literally a nutcase. And yeah. I'm like, what did I ever do I to that. you? I mean, I just came yeah, up and said, you know. I get that vibe off of him, too. Yeah, he seems to be a bit of a loose cannon. I kind of get that vibe without knowing him personally myself. But I, I do kind of get that vibe off of him. He seems to come out yeah. a little strong with, with pretty much everybody. And you're right. I don't think everybody does need that approach taken with them. You know, you seem like a pretty laid back guy that would respond to probably uh, somebody with the same kind of attitude. Well, I like what I said about the Leonard fight. I overtrained. You yeah. have to push yeah. me. You have right. to hold me back, you know. Right. And he wrote in his book that it's like stuff about me not wanting to spar certain people. I mean, I, I sparred Lennox Lewis. I sparred this guy named Shazon Bradley. He was 15 and 0, 15 knockouts, 245 pounds. I mean, I spar anybody. I like, I right. love sparring. Yeah. Leroy yeah. Caldwell, who's like a heavyweight that looks like Hercules, 240 pounder, <laughs> fought everybody and he had a great job. You know, he fought Foreman, Lyle, all those guys. And he went 10 rounds with them. You know, he had a great job. He hit me one time with a jab and it felt like my head was on a cord and it was like three feet back and then snapped back into place. <laughs> and I just kept going, you know, I didn't stop. So, yeah. uh, you know, there's no, it's just unfounded all the stupidity he said about me. But yeah. uh, anyway, that's his life and his being. And, and uh, you know, God bless him. Hopefully he does. Uh, hopefully he comes to his sanity one day and comes to his wits. Cause he really seems to be literally nuts. Delusional. Yeah. Um, not, so, not to uh, mention criminal, you know, you don't yeah. premeditate a murder of somebody. And then brag yeah. about, it. you know, what, what you're not <laughs> insane. <laughs> uh, now, I probably know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask you anyway. But at any point in your career, being a young guy in the boxing game, and I know there's been stories about this with guys like, uh, uh, I don't want to run him down or whatever, but, uh, um, you know, Arturo Gaddy. Some of these guys outside the ring uh, uh, ha have hit it pretty hard in terms of, like, the partying and the nightlife. Did you ever fall into any of those traps, or did you always find it pretty easy to live a pretty clean, uh, you know, boxing lifestyle? I've uh, You know, I've always been a, a natural medicine guy. I'm in a natural okay. thing and all that stuff. I ran marathons after boxing. I mean, I smoke pot. I still Me smoke too. pot. You know, I didn't, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't smoke anywhere near fights. I didn't smoke for six years while I fought in the right. prime, of, prime of my life, like maybe a few times in six years. Um, I drank once in a while when I wanted to. Like, I haven't had a drink in three weeks right now right. kind of thing. You know what I mean? Uh, so but no I, wild, I, reckless so no wild and reckless lifestyle then outside the ring. I, I wasn't interested in that. I was an athlete at the time, you know? Right, right, uh, right. Yeah. It, it wasn't like a lure to me. Women were a lure to me and boxing. I love boxing. I didn't, I yeah. didn't want to, you know, yeah. when I was finished that training at the day, I was tired. I went yeah, bed. yeah. Who's got time for all that nonsense, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I did go out to the China club and stuff when I, later on a little bit you get a little bit famous and there's all these beautiful women around you know yeah but I'm, sure. I, wasn't, I wasn't doing drugs or or like getting completely hammered or all that kind of stuff uh you know it's not that i haven't been drunk many times in my life but i mean 
no, that wasn't my wasn't my thing, and and not for any reason other than I wasn't interested in it really. Hey, listen, you're talking to a guy that knows what it's like to have to beat the chicks away with a stick. You know, what I mean, when you got the long blonde, you know, when you when you got the long blonde locks, Donnie, I guess it's a curse for us. You know, I mean, yeah, it's a tough one. You know, we you got, know, what we got. Do? so you're currently living where now? Out in out in uh, Costa Rica? Yeah, let me walk for a second and show you exactly where I am. I'm and in you the middle. love it? Out, you love it out there? And why Costa Rica? Probably uh, why not Costa Rica, right? But I mean, let me just show you. Donnie Lalonde is going to show us what he looks at every day. Look at that. Beautiful. 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 You know what it kind of reminds me of? It kind of reminds me of uh, the guy that had the big, uh, you know, the big drug overlord in Scarface. <laughs> uh, yeah, it could be. Could, could say that. Well, you know, you're you kind of like Sosa. <laughs> this is the only house. Gorgeous. You can see a house. It's about. Uh, a mile and a half away on top of the hill that way. Yeah. And then you can kind of see a house through the trees about a mile this way. I can show it to you. Yeah. And those are my closest neighbors. Look at this. See that wow, white, beautiful. The white spots up there? Yeah, yep. That's my nearest neighbors. That's where Sosa lives. That's where he is. <laughs> <laughs> so th this, this was a 1,000 acre project I was managing. Okay. Uh, and involved with, and I famously got blamed for being like some, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, Charles Manson, some some really, really bad guy, you know, who ripped off all these people and everything. It's a, it's a newspaper story. You've probably heard it if you ha yeah, haven't yeah. checked out. Okay. So it's all bullshit. I live right in the middle of it. I'm like, yeah, you want to say that stuff to me in the face? Come to the property that, that you say that I stole from. Like, do you think yeah. I would live right in the middle of it? My right. mother was the first <laughs> investor of the project that they talked about one of one of the two projects they talked about me doing this with as if what I robbed my mother. Like right, people right. are just so right. insane. The stuff <laughs> they come up with. And then mainstream media goes along with it because it fits their uh directive. You know, the Panama Papers was all about saying how bad of people are that use offshore banking. Look right. at this bad boxer what he did and he manip you know it, it, it's all just the freaking fraud and charade i don't know what you think anyway my wife has the saying shit show sh shit show sham charade <laughs> yeah 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 pretty much yeah so what do you think about these guys uh who come back and uh uh if it's all of a sudden kind of become the trendy thing to kind of start to dip your toe back into the boxing world at an advanced age do you think it's smart for some of these guys that have been retired to come back out of retirement to fight and would you yourself ever consider it or are you done first of all I don't think anybody can call anybody who gets in a boxing ring uh, logical or reasonable. I mean, it's not. <laughs> not. You know, it's, it's a pretty dangerous place to be. Sure, yeah, sure. It can, it can be. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I you know, you got to be nuts to do it in the first place, probably. Um, I personally, like, you know, I met Ray Leonard. I met up with Ray Leonard in uh, L.A. Uh, at a gym, let me say, um, eight years ago. Yeah. And we were talking, and he said, you know, Donnie, how is it for you? Like when you spar or train, cause I still did, you know, he goes, you know, one day for me, like, you know, previous to this day, right. I never even felt the punches, Like you yep. just didn't hurt me, you know? Yep. And yep. he goes, then one day it was just like, everything hurt. And he goes like, I mean, like really hurt. And it was yeah. just like, why am I in here? I don't want to do this anymore. You know? And I was, and at that time I said, no, you know, Ray, no, I never felt that, you know, but about, Four years later, I was in Malta training uh, some fighters, and I had this really strong punching Swedish kid, and he hit me in the stomach, and I, I mean, my whole body hurt. And I went, and I heard Ray saying that at the moment. I went, "Yeah, it hurt. Now, now it hurts. This is my day, you know." Yeah. So I think there comes a time where it's not very smart. Well, like I said, it never probably is very smart to be in a boxer, right. but I don't right. think I don't. I think there comes a time where it's very detrimental for people to do that. In a real co competition. Now, right, when I was right. I was with Ray last November in Mexico at the WBC convention, there was like eighty champions there or something, a whole bunch anyway. And um, we were just talking about the thing about the uh, these exhibitions. And I said, Ray, to me, the exhibitions are about entertainment. Right. It's nostalgia. They're not there to see us hurt each other. I mean, anybody who's sitting there wanting guys sixty years old to hurt each other. 
has to be a sadistic uh, effort who needs to be in a nut house. I mean, we're there to entertain and be nostalgic. And people say, wow, look at those two. They're still in great shape. Uh, it's fun watching them. Wasn't that a great fight they had? They're not there to see us hurt each other. Right. And, and if that's what a person's going in there to do, they're in it for the wrong reason. Would I do that? If Ray would do it, I would do it in a heartbeat. Just because, again, it would be a lot of fun and it would be entertainment. But I wouldn't be looking. I wouldn't want to hit him. I didn't want to hurt him right. when I fought him, let alone at 60 years old, 65 years old. If you watch my fight with Eddie Davis, I mean, I saw that the opportunity when I won the world title. And, and I held back, and then I threw the punch because I was like, this is my world title shot. I can't not hit him. And yeah. so I hit him, and, and he went down. His hands were still up even though he was unconscious. His legs were twitching like he was freaking dying. I felt horrible at 28 years old hitting somebody. I'm not going to hurt somebody at 65 years old or right. 62 years old, you know. So I really think that as long as it's entertainment and people understand what it is and they get – like I thought Tyson Roy Jones – was pretty good in that they didn't hit each other. They didn't hurt each other, you know, but it yeah. was fun to watch them. I, I enjoyed watching them. Now, you know? well, when Sugar Ray had come back, uh, uh, one of those times that he was out, I know he had a detached retina. And I can kind of sympathize because I don't know if you can tell, but I just had surgery on this eye. I had a deta just a spontaneous detached retina. And I literally just healed up from having surgery on this one. So I'm not even totally good on I'm not even totally good on this one yet. And this one's a mess. So I'm essentially walking around my house right now feeling pretty blind. There's a saying, there's a saying, you're blind in one eye and you can't see all the other. Yeah, that's how I feel. <laughs> that's how I feel, my friend. Yeah. That's but, how I but feel. But you would still box. <laughs> I could still well, well, you know, I mean, I myself was 15 and 0, and they were all knockouts, Donnie. Wow. Of course that's they were awesome. all in my of course they were all in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but hey. At least I was safe, you know. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, didn't have any real safer. I didn't have any of that real pain that you're talking about. Um, so In what's my life mind? I'm going to Carolina. Hey, um, <laughs> uh, uh, what were you saying about your eye? Yeah, so a week before I fought Virgil Hill, yeah, I, uh, I had sparred uh, James Tony and a couple other really, really talented kids. Yeah, uh, world, yeah, world rated super middleweights. Shout out to Lights Out, rounds. love them. But eight rounds, and Freddie Roach tells me. Give me one round with this guy, Kingsley Aikike. And Aikike's nickname was Sharp Knuckles. Okay. And I had sparred him. He was a big, long African guy with freaking yeah. like these hands. Well, he, he boxed Shane Mosley one day in the same gym. Yep. I was walking out of the dressing room to start training. Shane was walking into the dressing room to change after sparring. And I didn't recognize who it was. This guy walked in the dressing room, like lumps all over his face, beat Oof. up. And, and I said to Freddie, who is that guy? And he goes, what guy? So the guy just walked into their dressing room. He goes, Donnie, that was Shane Mosley. How could you not recognize him? You know, because I saw him all the time. He's in the gym. Yeah. I said, Freddie, he looks so different because his face is all welted up. And Freddie goes, yeah. yeah, that's sharp knuckles. Every time he hits somebody, he welts him. And so, and so before, in between rounds, I said, Freddie, why am I sparring this guy? I don't want to spar this guy. I've got a fight in one week against Virgil Hill. We just finished right. camp. I just did eight rounds. I feel great. I don't need this guy. And he goes, right. give me one round with him. You're going to feel great. He's got long arms like Virgil, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so I went out like a fool, my fault, 100%, kind of yeah. like pouty, just kind of like went out just flat. Yeah. He threw one jab, hit me in the eye, cut my eye wide open, oh. and damaged, my, damaged oh. my eye for life. Like right now, my eye is um, it, it, anything but straight on. I get split screen vision. And that's from this guy's jab, huh? One punch. Wow. And a week wow. before fighting Virgil Hill, my eye was split open. So, uh, you know, most people would have called it off. But, again, we're not logical or reasonable in boxing, so we do what we do. <laughs> but, anyway, the point is, uh, you know, I don't – I think there's a time and place for all of it. And, and, again, like, I'm happy to go to war with anybody. But at this point in my life, I don't need any of that. Right. I don't need to get hit in the head. You know, my bot my – my brain probably doesn't need to get hit in the head. You know, right, right. I hit lots, you know, over the years I played football. Yep. Yep. Before they had great helmets. You know, I got knocked out numerous times playing football. Like in the seventies, late sixties, early seventies, I played, uh, I was a running back, uh, punt return. You know, I got knocked out many times. I got knocked out playing hockey a number of times. Got to keep your head up. A few times I didn't, I paid for it. I yep. got knocked out in my home by my stepfather many times. And I got, you know, Hit in boxing a few times, probably sparred 500 rounds with I ran Barkley. Definitely many of them. And, you know, so we hit each other a couple of times. The bottom line is I don't need to get hit in the head at 62 years old. 
Right. But would I do a boxing exhibition with another logical, reasonable guy who, who we're going to like have some fun and, you know, we're going to hit each other a little bit, but that's okay. We're not trying to kill each other. I would do that in a heartbeat for fun and for yeah. entertainment, you know? So what's life like Ben, uh, um, after boxing for you? Uh, are you, uh, are you a, a parent yourself? Well, the, the, oh, I'm a parent. Yes. I have two, two children. Uh, and did, any of your children uh, did, uh, did any of your children decide to go into athletics, uh, specifically boxing or any kind of athletic endeavors? You know, funny, my wife was a three time NCAA champion, uh, pom pom girl, you know, so they really? do those pyramids and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Incredible athletes. And then I was a, a fighter. And neither one of us wanted to push that on our kids. You know, like right. my, mom, my, my wife's, my, our daughter said to my wife one day, why didn't you, you know, teach me to do this and get me to do that? And do that? I would like to have done that. And my wife said, nobody told me to do anything I did. I did it because I wanted to. Right. And we didn't want to push you into anything. We wanted you to find it for yourself. Right. And that's the same as my son. So at about 23, our son said, uh, Dylan is his name, said, um, Dad, you know, you were a world champion. I'm a pretty good athlete. He was a very good rugby player, a very good athlete. Mm -hmm. And I, and uh, and he said, do you think I should try boxing? I said, do you want to try boxing? He goes, yeah, I'd love to. I said, uh, okay, well, I'm going to Houston for a month to train a guy. Why don't you come with me, live like a boxer for a month, and see if you like it. Right. So he did. He sparred with uh, a couple of guys, like, I mean, like guys with 300 amateur fights and 14-0 and at pros. Uh, and they would hit him and he would smile. He thought it was so funny and, yeah. and he loved it, you know? Yeah. But then at the end of it, he goes, so what do you think? I said, Dylan, you punch like a mule. You don't mind getting hit. You can take a punch. You're yeah. smart in there. If you really wanted to be a fighter, I think you could be. And he goes, is it too late? And I said, no, Trevor Burbick started at 25, became heavyweight sure. champion in the world. I don't think so. And he goes, okay. He goes, what do I have to do? I said, you need to eat, sleep and live boxing. Yeah. And he goes, you know, I don't think I want it that much. I said, then don't do it. Yeah, absolutely. The other guys will die for the win. If you're not willing to give everything up, don't do it. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I think I shouldn't do it. And so he didn't. It was a good logical conversation, you know? Yeah, that's good. That's, that's good. That he I, thought. I wanted to give my kids what I didn't have. And he right. had a choice. Right. You know, so he's so, using his brain. He's a computer software engineer you know oh nice nice okay yeah. and now so you had said earlier that you're into uh uh a lot of the uh 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 holistic type of medicine uh what specifically do you mean like when you say that like what's your typical like ritual do you not take like uh prescription medicines are you all I've, all natural I've, organic i've taken two pharmaceutical drugs since 1980 or 79 uh twice i took one pain pill like just that points so when i had injuries that i just couldn't uh, handle it anymore like one time and uh uh i ha you know so i healed everything naturally like because I, I had surgeries that just didn't work i've had yeah. two shoulder surgeries i got a pin in my shoulder messed okay. it up i has had screwed up hand surgery you can see my hands all messed yeah. up yeah yeah look at that thing about Jeez. it anytime i got near a doctor they messed up i mean i'm talking about 10 years ago I broke my arm yeah and i went to the doctor and he put a cast on it he goes you should go to a specialist because the way this break is in san jose which is five hours away and he goes there's you know like uh what's it called uh uh private hospital so i went to a private hospital got the guys you know second opinion he went and looked at my x-ray came back and he goes you have two options he goes we can do surgery and put a plate on there and you wouldn't even need a cast because the plate will hold the bone in place and I recommend that because it's your radial bone. Your radial bone is what turns your hand. And if we don't fix it, you could have real problem with your hands. And he goes, you know, but there's upside, downside, and there's risk. I said, what's the risk? He goes, well, if I make a mistake, because I have to put pins, I have to put screws in that plate to hold it right. in. And if I make a mistake and hit a nerve or something, you could lose use of your fingers or tingling in your fingers, or you could use, lose, lose use of your hand. And I said, okay, doc, thank you. Could you, do you mind putting that cast back on? He turned beet <laughs> red and he goes, why? And I said, well, because you said, if you make a mistake, I can yeah. lose the use of my hand. He is human. He is human. No, and, and, oh, and he said, yeah. And I said, well, you already made a mistake. He goes, what? I said, it's not my radial bone. It's my ulnar bone. Oh, boy. He goes, what? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I said, this is not the radio bone. It's my ulnar bone. This one's my ulnar bone. Yeah, yeah. Goes, I just read the x-rays. I'm the doctor. What are you talking about? 
I said, yeah. go back and look at those x-rays. He came yeah. back, beat red, and he goes, I'll get you that cast. Yeah. You know, they're human <laughs> beings. They make mistakes. Sure. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. So, so I've, avoided, the... I've avoided them. I've avoided pharmaceutical drugs. I had pneumonia eight weeks and three days before I defended against Leslie Stewart. I did a natural protocol. By Monday, the doctor goes, because I was on a Friday, I was diagnosed. Monday, the doctor goes, uh, Dave, to my manager, because they're both into uh, pharmaceuticals. My manager was an addict. And the doctor says to him, Dave, I must have made a mistake. He doesn't have that anymore. Uh, he doesn't have that. I say, you didn't make a mistake, Jeffrey. I used the natural protocol and got rid of it. Yeah. And they won't accept that. You know, so right. he just said, I saw what happened. I made a mistake. I said, okay, you made a mistake. Let's go, Dave. Let's go to camp. I fought eight weeks later against Leslie Stewart, which made the Leonard fight happen. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. Okay. So going back to the Leonard fight now, uh, at that moment that you dropped Sugar Ray, and I forgot what round it was. It was around eight somewhere four. around there four. four round four you dropped sugar ray leonard um did you think at that moment in time when he was on the ground that she had won the fight that he wouldn't get back up i never thought for a second from when we signed the fight that the fight would happen let alone that i had to wait for him to be on the ground yeah. i honestly thought it was ridiculous the fight not because i'm donnie Law, i'm the greatest fighter in the world because he is a welterweight and i'm a light heavyweight right and if i could do one thing it was punch yeah, and I knocked out. I knocked out and hurt people much bigger than him. And I just thought, first time I connect with this guy, it's over. Yeah. And the first time I connected with him, you know, kind of good, he went down. So I walked back to the neutral corner, making the biggest mistake a fighter can make, thinking this is over as soon as I hit him again. So if you watch the fight, it changed at that moment. I went from fighting my fight, which lured him into that punch, yep, to waiting for him to be open and me land one. Yep. And he caught on to that. All of a sudden, he was in control of the fight, doing his razzle-dazzle bullshit. Yep. And he did a great <laughs> job of it. He took some really good punches. Halfway through the eighth round, or th uh, 30 seconds before the end of the – I'm sorry. Yeah, 30 seconds before the eighth, end of the uh, eighth round, I hit him with a – I think a, oh, no, into the eighth round. I hit him with a left hook, right hand. And from that point on – I'm sorry, that was the ninth round because that's the round it ended. From that point on, I literally hit him from pillar to post. Yeah. And I thought, I literally said to the referee with my mouthpiece that he didn't get it, what do you want me to do? Kill this old man? Stop this fight? Yeah. Because I had hit him so much and hurt him so much, but he obviously wasn't going to quit. You know, he was right. Ray Leonard, who had right. an unbelievable heart, ball, sure. sure. attitude. No one's going to deny that. Mind, right? So, uh, so I was concerned, again, for him. And uh, the ref went in to break it up at one point. I was exhausted. I, I was seeing triple yeah. and more from the fifth round on. And right. I didn't have nearly as much on my punch. But if you look at the fight, I had enough to hurt him. Right, uh, yeah, right. I was hitting him all over the place. And he was bouncing all over the place. But uh, when, uh, yeah, so the ref went to break us up. And I kind of stepped away with my hand down. And he threw a left hook on the break. If you watch it, that's exactly what happened. Yep. And I went down, you know. And he had me because I was so weak at that point. Yeah. And as I was getting up, I, I remember thinking to myself, <laughs> I can't even believe this. I was just asking the ref to stop the fight, and he's got me now because yeah. I had nothing left. Right. And I, I, if you look at the fight, I look up at him, and I kind of like nod my head and, and shrug my shoulders and just kind of go, holy shit, he's got me. And he right. came at me through a million punches. I didn't throw anything back. I yeah. made a miss. If you watch the fight, I was clear-headed enough. I yeah. made a mess. 99% of the punches he threw, and he threw a lot of them. Right. Then how the fight ended, again, if you watch it, it's all on tape. I lifted my head up to miss a punch. He hit me with a combination to my throat and crushed my larynx. Ooh. And because my larynx crushed, my body collapsed because I had yeah, no yeah. oxygen. Right, right. But before the count of one, I was starting to get up. Yeah. Because yeah. physically I was okay. Right. And, ment and mentally I was okay, but I had no – oxygen right your so body's like your, yeah your body's like i can't fucking breathe here <laughs> well, i can't move so yeah. i tried to get up and if you watch it was only like the count of two the referee yeah. richard Steele had me by the shoulders and he pushes me down and says donnie it's over you know and i just lied there and i just i can't even believe that just happened and now like i know a of, ago, i was freaking like think worried about this guy's health right you know and now i know obviously <laughs> boxers always you, you know always have to you know, keep up the image of they want to go out on their shield. You know, they always are upset when fights are stopped. What was your feeling about that stoppage, Joe? Do you agree with what Richard Steele did? 
Well, I mean, in retrospect, it's a good thing. And it hit me in the throat again, I would have died. I mean, it was, yeah. I was apparently 0. 0.02 millimeters away from dying anyway because my larynx was crushed. And there was very, very, very little space left for oxygen. Right. If you listen to my voice before that inter fight in the interview and now today after, from yeah. that minute on, it's different. My larynx yeah. was crushed from that yeah. punch. So in retrospect, it was very good. But at the time, I was arguing with him, Richard, right. let me up. I'm okay. Yeah. But I wasn't okay. I was exhausted right, right. and hurt, right. you know. And I had another fight where I got stopped in the ninth round where I knocked the guy down in the fourth. When I walked to the neutral corner, the same thought happened to me. His name was Willie Edwards. If I won that fight, I would have had Michael Spinks. That was 1984. 1984. I, I lose spots because my larynx Yeah, still. Yeah, I hear um, it, yeah. But anyway, um, in, in that fight, I got hit with a left hook. Apparently, the guy had brass knuckles on in between rounds. They split the, <laughs> they split the glove and said, uh, the glove is split. We have to change gloves. And saw a friend but a friend of mine in the opposite corner, in his corner. Uh, he was there because I was a co-promoter, and I needed somebody to help the guy because they yeah. were from Detroit. And I said, help him like you're not my friend. Just be good to him. Took good care of him. Uh, he, he said, in, 20 years later, he told me, I got to have lunch with you. So we did. And he goes, I just have to tell you something that's been on my conscience ever since. I said, what's that? And he goes, in between rounds, they put brass knuckles on the Edwards fight. I said, what? And he told me. Anyway, he hit me with a punch, and you can watch the fight again. It's all on tape. I've never been hit with a punch, and the same thing happened to me. I went up and down four times, over, how? and he never hit me clean again. Over how, the do they get brass knuckles? How, how do they get brass knuckles on them when the gloves are on and they're, and they're all taped up? They took the gloves off in between rounds, because the one glove off, his left glove, because they said there was a split in the glove, which my friend said they split. Wow. They did it in between rounds. If you don't watch the fight again, there was like a two, three minute break because they had to change gloves. Wow. And uh, yeah. so in essence, they pulled kind of like a uh, a Louis Resto on you. Yeah, exactly. That's what happened. You know, you know they're, they're from tactics. Detroit. Uh, Billy Goots was the guy's name. He's no longer alive. Uh, Lendale Holmes was a, was a super middleweight champion. He was in the corner and Willie Edwards was the fighter. Now, I don't give a shit, honestly, you know, in the end. Because bottom line is, my hand was down. He hit me with that left hook, right. and I didn't get up from it. And uh, But my point was, after the fourth or fifth time, I can't remember that, I went down. The ref, Steve Cross in uh, Houston, great guy, uh, saw him in, in uh, WBC uh, convention in Mexico last November. Big hug to each of us. You know, we love each other. Uh, he, he goes to stop the fight. And I, and I was literally staggering across the ring saying, Steve, what the hell are you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> and he's like, look at you, Donnie. You can't stand up. I got to stop it. I was arguing with him, you know. I was out of it. But So what do I think of that? As a fighter, I would rather die on my shield. Sure. But as a human being, I think it's foolish because, you know, we're young kids. We have a whole right. life ahead of us. Look at the family. Right. It's bravado. Some beautiful. of it's bravado. Well, it's also the fact is I would rather have died and lost a fight at that right. time in my life. Right. It was that important to me. Right. So why take that away from me? You know, I mean, there is both sure. sides to it. You right. Know? And, you know, it might be some for some people, they might just be saying that. But for me, it was more important to become a world champion than it was to, to live. Right. If I, if I had that choice, you know. Now, you and maintained so, over the years. Have you maintained over the years a pretty good friendship with Sugar Ray Leonard, though? Yeah, yeah, we've, we've always gotten along very well. We almost got into business together after doing a uh, boxing fitness and boxing stuff together. We worked hard on it for a while. So I'm sorry, I'm just going to play. No, it's okay. That's okay. So um, speaking, obje uh, speaking objectively, though, let me ask you, because it was it does involve uh, your buddy Sugar Ray, and it was hot, uh, hotly contested and widely debated. Uh, what did you think uh, years prior to that, though, in the Leonard Hagler fight? Where did you stand well, on that? Well, that was less than two years before. So, you know, that was the last fight before Ray and I fought. Right, right. And um, he had a detached retina, yep. you know, so I thought it was risky. But again, what's logical and reasonable about getting in a boxing ring with Marvin Hagler and trying to fight him? Right. Nothing for anybody. You know what I mean? Or did the decision Ray go to the, did, did, Do you think the decision went to the right person? Did Ray do enough to win that fight? I did not think so. No. You know, at the time, especially, I was really in, uh, I was more into Hagler than Leonard, and um, I thought Leonard did a lot of razzle dazzle and not a lot of real punching. But the reality right. is, if you watch the fight, Hagler did just enough.
to let them take it from him. Right. Like, what the hell was he doing fighting Orthodox? Right, right. What was he doing following Ray around? If he well, would have Ray fought Ray like Duran fought Ray the first fight, right. like Hagler fought Tommy Hearns, right, right, it would not have been the same fight. Well, I think but what Ray, Ray gets Rodney away with a lot, that. what Ray seems to get away with a lot is, uh, and I think it, it it really impresses the judges sometimes is he would steal. Seem like he would steal rounds in all the last ten seconds by hitting you with a lot of those shoe shine combinations where he's just hitting you very fast a lot of times. Exactly, and there's nothing on it. But the bottom line is. Whatever works. Yeah, effective. I yeah. mean, like, look at uh, Floyd Mayweather. Yeah. I honestly never enjoyed watching the guy fight. Me neither. Because I'm a puncher. I like <laughs> I like fights. You know what I mean? I like, like, it's called a fight because there's two guys hitting each other. Right, the guy right, right. so talented. For me, it was boring to watch. Right. Yeah, but, me too. Not aesthetically pleasing. That's for sure. Right. But does that make it bad or something wrong with him? Or, you know what I mean? Like, right, right. bottom line is, it is what it is. And he did what he had to do to win. And he did what he had to do to stay healthy and super wealthy. Right, so right, right. So it's off to him, you know? And when you Ray look at Leonard, a guy like Floyd, when you look at a guy like Floyd, do you share the sentiments of the rest of the uh, collective boxing world and, and put him as the go? Is he the greatest of all time? Not a chance in hell. Not even close. No. What about, what about like a guy like, uh, uh, oh my God! What's his name? The Mexican guy he was seventy. Duran was seventy-two and one. Yeah, and had uh, it beat his uh, one loss, Esteban de Jesus, who was a world champion, uh, beat him in a rematch. Seventy-two and one after beating Sugar Ray. Julio Cesar Chavez got to eighty-nine and zero. Oh. There you go. I was going to yeah. say him next, I, and I was thinking of a Mexican. There's another one. Oh yeah. my God! I'm forgetting his name. But I, I was anyway. I spent a fair amount of time with the guy. He was something like 71 and 0, and he lost one fight and then retired yeah. and went into a depression, lost his family, went to drugs, ended up on the street because he lost one fight. Right. You know, right. And that guy, I mean, what? Uh, Mayweather's better than him. Mayweather's 50th win is against the guy who's never had a boxing match. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's you know? kind of a, yeah, that's kind of a taint that he should have an asterisk next to a couple of these last fights here. Yeah, and he had some fights that, you know, were arguably not not wins, you know. But right. I mean, Everybody can say that right. in a sense also, you know. So, again, I don't knock Floyd for doing what he did. I told him when I saw him in Mexico, I said, Floyd, I want to give you one compliment. And it has nothing to do with boxing. You are the smartest boxer who ever fought. Oh, yeah. Because oh, look yeah. at the freaking money he's making and he doesn't yeah. get touched. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's brilliant. So I live right down him. the street. I live right down the street from the International Boxing Hall of Fame. I'm right down the road from Canastota, so I was up there. Uh, wow. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm I'm a, a couple miles away from there, so I uh, I went this last Hall of Fame weekend because of COVID. They had the whole, uh, you know, they had the yeah. There you go. I see plenty of those up there. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so I saw that big class go in. I did get a glimpse of Floyd uh, uh, up at the casino. Got to wave to him. Got to say hi to him. He's obviously very hard to get to or whatever. Now I I recently spoke to Chop Chop Corley. He said Floyd Mayweather can't punch either. <laughs> well, I mean, you can't punch if your first priority is defense. Right, 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 right. You're not trying to win a fight by a knockout. It's pretty right. hard to be pretty solid on your feet, you know? Right. Uh, to plant so your punches. Look at this. Oh, I love it. I love it. The key to Canastota. Ed broke yeah. his name on there. You can't take it away from me. I'm not it, saying I deserve to be in there. It's but I'm in the city. Town. I've got, got the key to Canastota, and your name's on there, Ed. <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a great little town. It's a great little town. Uh, I sometimes think when I see the Boxing Hall of Fame, though, and I'm sure you've obviously been there, uh, I would like to see it be more of like how Cooperstown is with the Baseball Hall of Fame. I wish boxing would really get its just due and really just get a nice big Hall of Fame that could really display a lot more because it's really very small. It's a lot of plaques and some memorabilia, but I'd really like to see it being such a storied sport with such a rich history. I'd really like to see it get something a little more befitting of it. Well, hey, you know, I mean, that would be wonderful, but let's give uh, Just Do where it's deserved. I mean, it, at least we have that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you God. Know, it, yeah. It's fantastic to have that. But yeah, sure, of course, would it be nice to have a more grandiose one with a lot more like you say, memorabilia, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, I don't know where half the, you know, guys belts are like Ali and all those kind of guys. Right. It would be awesome to have them up in a place like that. You know, mine now got when stolen. Was, you know? Now when I was researching for this interview and I don't know if this is, if this is a project you're still involved in, but, uh, uh, if, if you are, can you talk to me a little bit about what TKOO is? And is that something that you're still doing and involved in? 
Okay, so TKO stands for taking care of our own. I love it. I love the concept. It, it, it comes from the idea of watching Don King walk in the ring with his fighter. His fighter gets knocked out. He steps over him and hugs the next guy. You're right, says, right. Let's go. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, where's and the next forget guy? About that guy. Huge shackles. Right, forget about the guy lying down on the yeah. ground. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it comes from my love of, of people like Iran Barkley, yeah. Hector Camacho. Uh, I mean, there were some amazing fighters yeah. that I met in 1990, I think it was three, in Las Vegas at the WBC convention. I think it was their 49th convention. And there was like 83 champions, I believe. There are 90 champions. And, yeah. you know, anybody who was anybody was there. And they all seemed perfectly normal like camacho and uh everybody ray everybody who was there they were all there foreman uh, everybody and um i'm just going to show you a little something and um uh oh yeah when i after afterwards i was walking out sorry in the arena uh in the uh casino at, at, it was at the mgm and i saw i ran barkley you know, because in the arena or in the the event, he recognized me right away. Recognized everybody. Everybody recognized him. Yep. Everybody got along, yep. hugging each other, talking, laughing, joking. I mean, totally with it. And then walking in the uh, casino, you know, he, he looked like an old old man, very lost. And I, I wish I wouldn't have said his name. Sorry, I, sh I should not have said that, champ. But. Um, and, and I, I think he's a little bit better from this. And he's one person we did do some work with with TKO, some of the, the uh, modalities, um, you know, cranial sacrotherapy, coconut oil, different things that help get, keep the brain going. But anyway, uh, and I said, how are you doing? What are you doing? He goes, uh, you know, really slowly. I'm not going to say it that slow. We don't have that much time. Yeah, and, and he yeah. goes, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm looking for my room. And I'm like, oh, okay, what room is it? And he goes, I don't know. I said, okay, well, do you have a key? He goes, nah, nah. And again, really slow. And I said, okay, well, let's go to the uh, front desk and get you a key. And he goes, uh, okay, where is it? And I and I told him, you know, so we, we go and he had no idea. I said, which tower is it in? He goes, nah, I don't know. I don't know. Sad, you know he, sad. he had no idea. Yeah. And then Camacho, the same exact after after I went through it all with Iran, we got him a new key and got him on his way and stuff, in the elevator. Uh, I ran into Camacho right after that, and the exact same thing happened. And I mean, he was dancing and laughing and having fun and talking to yeah. everybody. Like it's because you're around people that are your people, right. and you come to life. But these people, these guys were hurt, you know. And it was sure. just like, my God, what can I do with my life more important than helping these guys I warred with? Like I ran, like I said, we boxed many, many rounds together. Gil Clancy. Uh, uh, all the guys from ABC, NBC, CBS used to come watch us spar and Gleason's would be packed because Iran and I would have just incredible gym wars. Um, so, you know, it, was, it came from that, that and the passion for all the guys that are hurt. I mean, I was hurt. I didn't know I was hurt, but I was hurt too. I had to do stuff to, to get healthy again. And, right. and uh, you know, but what ended up happening is right around that time is when this financial crisis happened and the project here died. And all of a sudden, everything went sideways financially in my life. I'm not a money manager. And, and so all, all of a sudden, I went from having lots and lots of money to not having the ability to manage my own self and money, right, right. let alone travel around the world trying to help people. And I, you know, I went to the Lou Ruvo Center, who's doing a, which is doing a very big pharmaceutical drug uh, what's it called, study by uh, testing and giving products to uh, fighters to try to help them and, and to measure and trying to create a drug for dementia. And, you know, I'm into natural medicine. So I said to them, you know, I can't do part of your study because I'm not going to be a guinea pig. You're right. not going to use me right. like that. Right. I said, but I have an idea that why don't I do, why don't you guys help me do my program and you do your program and right. maybe you have 50 guys and 10 do my program and four, uh, all of them do your program. And then the unique 10, if there's a difference, then we know that my thing works. Right. And they were like, well, that's a great idea, but we're not in the business of trying to cure people. We're in the business of trying to sell 
de- uh, uh, develop a drug that we can sell oh, to make money. Man. Yeah. You know? That's unfortunate. And so that's what I mean by natural medicine. Like I'm into, I believe that, hey, if the, look, if, look at that storm coming. Uh, Oof, a rain, yeah. Rain. You're going to get a good one. If, You're going to get a good one. If there is if, if there is a consciousness that can create this. Yeah. <laughs> you Amen to that. A couple of scientists, a couple of scientists with a, an agenda to make money can yeah. devise something more important, more a better yeah. solution than this, you know. Absolutely. So, so, I know that there are that there my personal experiences taught me that anything I have been challenged with, there is a solution naturally to heal it. I've always yeah. been able to find that, you know. Yeah. Yep. So that was my motivation was to do all these studies with all these guys. But you know, I needed to have the fighters come here uh, or somewhere, stay right. somewhere. My idea was to do like a, a training camp, a two month training camp on my protocol and it's not my protocol there was like natural medicine doctors recommendations natural medicine doctor oversight um you know i I mean it would have been like very professionally done right but but they come here and do this protocol for a couple months like a training camp we weigh them before they come in they do all these cognitive tests before they come in blah 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 they stick to our diet they take our supplements they do all the programs we suggest and then in two months they come out ready to you know, not you know to, to be the champ again, and That's I great. really think that it would have been an amazing success. And I'm not um, absent or, or uh, I'm not unwilling to try it again. And I'm back. I'm getting back to where financially I'd be able to focus on that. The problem is nowadays anybody who tries to do anything through natural medicine suicides themselves with three bullets in the back of their head. So, you know, I'm not really sure I want to, I'm, I'm that committed that, right. I, that I want to end up suiciding myself with three bullets to the back of my head. Right, right, right. I hear you. <laughs> you know, so well, unfortunately, um, being a uh, person who believes in God and believes in nature and believes in, you know, uh, the creator that created us, healing us, those people are, are not welcome in this world. So, you know, that whole yeah. media thing was all about, what they call canceling somebody. I was one of the first canceled. Yeah. You know, shut this yep. guy up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 1980, I did. There was a whole newspaper, a whole page of the front page of Winnipeg Free Press about me saying, they said, the AMA wants to ban boxing. What do you think? And I said, we need to ban the AMA. Yeah. To tell people that drinking cow's milk is good for human beings. You know, yeah. no animal in the world drinks another animal's cow. I mean, right. milk. I went on to talk about the casein and cow's milk and what it does to our body and blah, blah, blah. You know, I've been vocal about stuff my whole life. And the yeah. last thing they want me to do right now is talk about the crap they're shoving down people's throat and into their body right now, you know. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Well, I think it's a great cause. Uh, I wish you the best of luck with it because I think it's so important that these guys afterwards, and I know from being up at the casino, or I mean, not up at the casino, up at uh, in Canastota. Well, uh, yeah, this year they had the Hall of Fame ceremony up at the casino. So being there and over at Canastota and seeing the condition of some of the guys, uh, you know, and how much they've deteriorated. And, you know, they've been giving us entertainment and putting their own bodies on the line for us, you know, for the fans. And, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, uh, Father Time is not kind to them after the fact, you know, so it's certainly a worthwhile cause that you're doing. And, uh, you know, I love the fact that, you know, uh, the whole mantra behind it about taking care of your own and, you know, taking care of each other. That's absolutely fantastic, man. I wish you the best of luck with it. I really do. Well, thank you. Thank you. My Our daughter, Yasef, I know the kids uh, did the athletics. She could punch like unbelievable. She, yeah. she, she could have been an incredible fighter, honestly. And she's tough as nails. She, but, you know, I, I never thought of my daughter being a, a woman boxer. Right. Back right. then in the 80s and 90s, we didn't think of women boxing. Yeah. Not seriously like they do today. But anyway, um, it's the last thing I probably would have wanted her to be. But yeah. anyway, um, she wants to continue this on. She went to a, a dinner that was put on, uh, dinner with the champ or something like that, uh, for Iran Barkley in New York uh, a year or two ago. Jerry Cooney, everybody was there. It was really great. They raised a ton of money for him. And she went there and did one of her pieces of art. She does um, uh, nudes. Oh, beautiful work. Beautiful. So she did one of those uh, at the event and then sold it, you know, auctioned it off for Iran. 
And uh, she wants to me. She wants me <laughs> to continue this on, and she wants me to do a podcast, and you know all this kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, I, I probably need to get motivated and do it. But you know, it's yeah. just like I'm so heartbroken about the bio weapon that is killing so many people in the world. And I honestly believe, like, because most of these guys will walk right into that. I honestly yeah. believe. I maybe I'm a fatalist. I, I mean, I honestly think we have very little time left and not yeah. many of these people are going to be alive feels like you the see, end but, feels like end times it does yeah you know uh rafael nadal yeah. probably one of the greatest fittest Tennis athletes players. Ever, yeah. ever in the world did you see him collapse at that press conference recently yeah yeah you know when you get a guy like that sitting in a chair collapsing yeah yeah he, he apparently collapsed on the court and never saw it but apparently uh you know Many athletes, just the other day, a triathlete in, uh, I believe it was Canada, a doctor. Yep. Just collapsed while she was uh, swimming in a triathlete and then yep. died right after. You know, there's, yeah. there's no coincidence that way more people are dying of un unknown causes. Yeah. Uh, SADS, you know, whatever that is. And I've met uh, Mr. Berkeley up at the casino, too. I mean, uh, or up at the, uh, I want to keep saying casino because that's where they had the festivities this year. <laughs> I, 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 I've met uh, Iran Barkley uh, uh, up at the Hall of Fame several times. Very gracious guy. Always very fan friendly. Lovely man to the fans. He really is. Signs everything. Takes pictures. Um, he's a great he's a guy. Fantastic guy. Yeah. And you guys Period. get so much of yourself, like I said earlier, put so much of yourselves out there for our entertainment in such a brutal fashion in such a brutal sport that, uh, uh, you know, there should be something for the guys afterwards. You know, there should be some, some way to take care of these guys, you know, I, 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 sort of akin to like professional wrestling. I don't want to compare the two, but those guys really have no, you know, uh, you know, uh, after their career type of plan either, if they haven't been smart with their money or made enough money. I mean, well, you know, um, we can't be expected when you look at the edge, the average education level of a boxer, right, and their money management skills, if you put right. those two together, the chances are of them being successful, no matter how much money they make, right, is minuscule, right, right, right. But uh, that being said, I have an idea also to do with TKO has to do with cryptocurrencies. Yep. You know, I believe. I don't know if you know anything about it, but there was just a, a great big crash of a few famous coins. Uh, one was worth $40 billion. And within, let's say, a day, it all of a sudden was worth a certain amount of millions. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Uh, I think I think they're being infiltrated by banker types that don't want the competition because these um, platforms, you know, they offer 15 18% return, you yep. know, yep. and they can do it. But not if certain people with a lot of money, you know, buy up a majority of it and then crash it. I mean, that can be done, you know. So, uh, but anyway, the bottom line is Bitcoin you cannot destroy. Right. So, for example, you're a very wealthy guy who loves boxing, loves boxers, loves Iran Barkley. Instead of, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with any of this, so I'm not saying there is. But instead of these guys having to go have dinners put on for them because they're these uh, athletes that don't have the capacity to do it themselves. Right. Through blockchain technology and Bitcoin, how about if you, okay, Mr. Super Wealthy guy who's got 300,000 Bitcoin sitting in a safe somewhere that's not never going to sell them until they're worth a million each. Why don't you just donate the staking fees which it's, you know, you just, you put, give it back to the system and they use that for the energy, blah, blah, blah. I don't, without getting into too, too much detail, but it's called staking instead of, let's say, putting your money in the bank, getting interest. Mm -hmm. So you stake your coins to the uh, platform. It is then used until you take it out and you earn X on it. Give your staking fees. It doesn't cost you anything. Right. Give right. your staking fees to the fighter so he can just live a good life. You know, he can live X amount of money per month. Yeah. Cost you yeah. nothing. You still own the Bitcoin. Yeah, it's just yep. passing on. The, you know, that's one thing that could be done. Yep. There's a number of things. There's actually a platform that I'm invested in that I won't get into the name or anything. I don't want to sound like I'm trying to put, promote the thing. Yep. But it, what it does is it's an intellectual property rights medium of which people can expo exploit 
and expose intellectual property rights. It can be physical assets, but it can also be digital assets. Like, for example, you could take a very famous photo or experience from a, a Duran Hagler fight a Dur or Duran uh, Barkley fight. Mm -hmm. A great, a great shot. Have somebody yep. sketch it and make yep. an NFT out of it. Yep. But these NFTs, this technology, makes them programmable. So, in other words, you could do ten of them only. Right. And they're hundred dollar NFTs. In other words, they're worth a hundred dollars. It says on them hundred dollars. Right. 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 You can spend that hundred dollars on anything on the platform that you want to buy coins, uh, uh, merchandise, whatever, anything of the fighters. Right. Uh, you know, autographs, all that stuff. Or because they're unique. Only ten of them, rare. They might be worth a thousand, or ten thousand, or a hundred thousand, right, right, or a million right, dollars. Right. Right. So there's these platforms in using the blockchain technology today that I'm I have to just put focus onto to try and make this work. But the difficult part is, of course, having the guys understand it, and then having the people around them understand it right because a lot of these people who put on these events make money putting on events right right a lot of these people putting on events enjoy putting on the events because they get to be around the fighters and people sure. think they're heroes because they're putting it on which they are yep yeah but i mean it, it becomes kind of like you know uh self more uh, about the event more about the event and less about the cause right the cause yeah. is these guys need help financially yeah. for life yeah and yeah. A, you know they they want adoration they want people to you know show their respect and love for them yeah absolutely you know, so put on a dinner and 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 raise the money for uh, uh an organization that buys more of these things that helps more of these fighters absolutely absolutely you know I mean? couldn't so agree with you more guy, yeah the guy is there as the celebrity superstar helping to raise money for his fellow fighters yeah he doesn't need the money because he's already yeah. got the money coming in right from the program, right exactly you know? Yeah, I so love it's it. Just a little twist that I would sure, like to, sure. you know. But I'm You've telling you, it's hard to do stuff. It's hard, it's you, hard to do stuff from out here. <laughs> You've got some fantastic ideas, though, and uh, 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 and I think the boxing uh, slash you know combat sports world uh, certainly needs that, and certainly needs to treat these guys a lot better. I can literally sit here and pick your brain and talk to you all day, man. This has been great. I really appreciate the time. I hope we can do this again sometime. Anytime. No problem, man. As you can I'm see, in. I'm not busy. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. I have absolutely loved this, man. Uh, if I didn't have another interview scheduled for later on, I could literally sit here and just talk to you for hours, my man. Former WBC <laughs> champion, Donnie, the golden boy. And he was the golden boy first. I don't want to hear no shit about Oscar. This was the golden <laughs> boy right here. A couple of legends sitting here. Our audience is going to love this. Just two legends sitting here shooting the <laughs> shit, you know? I got to get my hair back your color. Probably you, maybe a little more legend than me, but... You know, oh, oh. Hey, <laughs> whose mind are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I really appreciate it, Donnie. Thank you so much for being on Pod Scum, man. I really enjoyed it, man. I really my did. Pleasure. I enjoyed it. I yeah, enjoyed yeah. It Talk care. to you soon, my friend. Thank you. Good you. Yep. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. There you have it, folks. The great Donnie Lalonde living the life out there in Costa Rica. I mean, geez, showing us around the house. The guy's living some life. I mean, but you know what? He's earned it. And he's got some great things to say about helping boxers after their career. And uh, we love him. We salute him. Uh, support all of his endeavors. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Very informative, smart guy, man. And uh, we'll have him on again. He's a friend of the show for sure. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of Pod Scum. This is your host and bastard of ceremonies, the one and only Rex Ruger, signing off. <laughs>